right, hello everybody. Um, sorry we're a few minutes late today, later than I wanted to be, but just trying to get some stuff ready. We've got some ice water here. We've got hot water in here. We're gonna try and talk about, or rather try and make, to measure the wind speed. So we're gonna talk first about wind speed, how we get wind, why there's wind in the first place. Oh, let me switch that over. And then we're gonna focus on trying to measure the wind speed and how do we go about doing that. So let's start off with this, probably the comes from in the first place. And the biggest reason really why we have any weather on the planet is because the sun is unevenly heating up the earth. And if it weren't for the sunshine, we wouldn't really have any weather at all. The temperature would be the same across the entire planet. It'd be extremely cold too, but because every day the sun is heating up the earth unevenly in two ways. The dark side, the side that's getting nighttime, certainly isn't getting any heat from the sunshine. But probably more importantly is that near the equator, we get a lot more sunshine and much stronger sun than we do at the North Pole and the South Pole. So every day there's all of this extra heat that's going around the equator. If you think of maybe a really hot place in the United States, we would think of Florida, maybe Texas, uh, down into Mexico, and certainly as you get down into the island, temperatures are cooler. That difference is pretty much the biggest reason for weather. So the temperature difference that's created is what drives everything. So it's going to drive thunderstorms, hurricanes, ultimately a little bit of everything. So just maybe out here, we've got kind of a field for you. The sun comes out, heats things up. We talked about this with our clouds forming as well. Heats up the ground. We talked about our hot air it up with that flame and it gets really hot. The air expands and it rises up. That's the same thing that happens here. But when the air rises up, it leaves kind of this empty void. It leaves low pressure behind. So the air rises, it goes to rush over here to fill in that emptiness, that low pressure that was created. So we get this loop, and you can see this here just kind of on a small scale on a day where we get a lot of sunshine, heats things up, and then that cool air rushes in to replace it. But especially we see this over at the beaches. So if you're ever on the beach, and it's typically windy at the beach, sometimes much more than others, but that's what we call a sea breeze. It's the same idea. Sun comes out during the morning, starts to heat up the ground, and it gets hotter here at the beach on summer vacation. You go there, the sand is really hot, you can barely walk on it sometimes, but then you get over toward the wind temperature might still be about 70 degrees. So we've got this really hot land, the, the air rises up because of it, ultimately it sinks down over here over the cool ocean, and then all that breeze comes in back to the land. So that's why at the beach it's so windy, and ultimately while we're able to kind of cool things off right over by the water. All that hot air rises, the cool air sinks down and blows right off the water back onto land. So this is kind of another small scale picture of what's going on when we talk about windy weather. But this happens over the size of entire continents, or over the size of countries. So that's why we're able to get such windy weather and such uh, big weather features. What I want to do is try and create this here for us in this little tub. So what I did, it might not work perfectly, need to get a little bit more water in here I think but we've got do we have the food coloring here we go we've got warm water in here and so ideally what I would do is be able to split this buck this thing right in half but I can't really do that so we're gonna just do this we're gonna put some red food coloring in here and this represents our warm water and it really is it's warmer uh, we use the hot water here at the TV station to get that to work I'll mix it all up for you you can see let's see not too hot but certainly or so and in this one I put this in the freezer so I have some ice, or at least ice water, that I dyed blue. And what I want to do, you're probably going to have to get pretty close here, Brett, and I'm just going to put some of this in one side, and what I'm hoping will happen is we'll see this ice blue cold water sink down and ultimately work its way over and kind of create that same loop that we were just talking about. So what I'll do here is use one of my cups we're going to use later for the anemometer try and pour this in here. I'll pour it right in the front. Let's see if we can get this to work. So now you probably notice, if you look closely, that most of that sinks right down to the bottom. I'm going to pour in a little bit more. Let's just make this, let's kind of do this all at once. It should sink down right to the bottom, and then because it's colder, it's going to want to stay down there. And you see here starting to push over more and more to this side. And what it's doing as it works its way over to that side is it takes all that warm air, or warm water rather, and it's kind of pushing it back up. So we're creating that same sort of loop that we were looking at there with our sea breeze, but this time we did it just by putting in that cold 
little bit better yourself at home if you just use the right size tub, or maybe even just a, a glass bowl will kind of make the same thing for you. But if you get some blue ice cubes, if you freeze them with the same effect, you'll see this loop, this kind of current that starts to take place. Let's see if I can put some more in here. It's tough, once the water turns purple, it's hard to really see too much more. But you can kind of get the idea here. Uh, no, I think we're I think we're done. I think our color is pretty much changed. Thank you for the paper towel, Sam. Uh, but this is one here. It's a little bit separated still. You can see if you look really closely. See if I can come on this side with you. Look real close. The blue is all kind of concentrated toward the bottom. And meanwhile, maybe from this side, Brett, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but the pink or that red color, all that warm air, gets settled more so at the top. But ultimately, what will eventually happen is that all the warm and all the cold will kind of come together because just like the planet inside here, everything really just wants to be equal. It wants to be the same. It wants that equilibrium, whether we're talking about high pressure, low pressure, cold temperatures, hot temperatures, everything really wants to even out. So that's why now we've got more of this purple color kind of taking over. Let me get these out of the way. Samantha, thank you very much. This one over here. Again, if you try that at home, the easiest way to do it is probably dye your water blue ahead of time, make blue ice cubes, and then put those in the hot water. What's really good about that is ice floats in water, so that's actually gonna keep it up at the top, and then you'll really start to see that current that's able to get, uh, that kind of gets set up and gets built. So here's our sea breeze. This is what happens when you're at the beaches. It's actually the opposite at nighttime because at nighttime the land gets cooler than the ocean, so it kind of creates this flip-flop effect at nighttime, and the breeze goes this way instead, so kind of opposites. So we've got a sea breeze and then a land breeze. We talked about this a little bit with high pressure and low pressure, but this is a reason to get our wind and on our weather maps what it looks like. High pressure always wants to go to low pressure, so that is because the atmosphere, again, like we were just saying, would much rather be equal everywhere, whether it's temperatures or whether it's the air pressure. It wants to be at equilibrium. When we talked about at the very beginning, the sun unevenly heating the planet, because it does that every single day, we're never really going to be at equilibrium. So the weather is created in an effort to make everything equal. Again, I just like to put this in here, kind of the waterfall picture as a reminder. High pressure, the top of the waterfall where it's higher up, that's always kind of working its way down toward lower pressure, lower at the bottom. So now, how does the air do that? Again, high pressure tries to go to low pressure, but there's one big thing that messes it up. It doesn't flow right from one to the other. Because the Earth is spinning, it's rotating on its axis, we get this force that we call the Coriolis force. And what that does is stop the air from going straight from high pressure to low pressure, and it starts to turn it to the right. So I didn't write that down here, but kind of the buzzword here that, you'll, that you might hear one day is Coriolis force, and that is because of the turning of the Earth, we ultimately get our winds going like that. So now if we put this on a big weather map, here's how it looks. The air doesn't go again from high pressure to low pressure, it actually goes in between them. So here's a perfect example. We've got a big low pressure system out here off of the coast of Canada. Meanwhile, high pressure builds in right across the middle of the country. And instead of the winds going from here to here, they actually run parallel to these white lines. Those white lines are called isobars. And what that is is a measure of equal pressure in the atmosphere. So we've got low, 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 low pressure. And then as we go each one of these white lines, the pressure is getting a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And it's in between the two of these. When we're sin sandwiched in between a low, low pressure system or a strong storm system and then a powerful high pressure system, that's when we get some of our windiest weather pretty much anywhere up and down the East Coast. So it's kind of when we're sandwiched in between the two. The changing of one weather pattern as one leaves and a new one moves in. So again, we kind of think of high pressure to low pressure with things working their way from one to the other, but ultimately this kind of happens where the air and the wind go in between the two. There we go, let's see. So I want to talk about some of the wind speeds that we've seen on the planet. The strongest wind in the United States, this used to be the world record for a while, 231 miles per hour. So this is in New Hampshire, it's the Mount Washington Observatory, and that was measured back in 1934. It was the world record for the strongest wind on land, 
231 miles an hour. But you have to keep in mind that mountain is more than 6,000 feet high up in the sky, but they get all sorts of wild weather there. And that actually occurred on a day that was a lot like what we we're just talking about. Strong low pressure systems moving out to sea as high pressure moves in, sandwiched in between the two, 231 miles per hour. For a point of reference, we were talking about our tornadoes from last Monday. The strongest winds that we had in those tornadoes were around 160 miles per hour. So we're talking much stronger than that. And that was just a, a weather system there and people were actually inside the observatory when that happened checking on the checking on the instruments just to give you an idea of how extreme the weather can be there that was a nice summertime picture this here is a wintertime picture you can see everything is caked in ice the ice is blown off to the side it's a really wild place for weather instruments to be and most weather instruments that we have would not be able to withstand what goes on up there uh, but that's a really powerful, powerful wind. Now in 1996, that record was broken and it was broken by a wind gust of 253 miles per hour. And where we're looking here, this is in a hurricane off the coast of Australia and it was Barrow Island where they actually had uh, some instruments to measure it. And it was 253 miles an hour. That was back in 1996 hurricane, or they call it their tropical cyclone, but Olivia. So some extremely powerful winds. And when we talk about winds that strong, that would easily be a category five hurricane, the way we talk about them here in the United States. So that is kind of the, uh, th those are the, the strongest winds we've had. And of course, on a, a day like today out there, you end up with things that are going to be relatively lighter. Now you want to go even stronger than that. Just about every planet here is going to have its own winds, thanks to that same uneven heating of the atmosphere on each of these planets. But the winds on Neptune up to 1,500 miles per hour. So an enormous difference than what we're talking about. That's six times stronger than our strongest winds here on Earth. So pretty wild to think that that's going on out there. And that's something scientists are just really starting to unravel more now that we're getting a better idea thanks to the Voyager mission and things going that far out into our solar system to get a better idea of where those winds are in the atmosphere and how strong they are and how deep of a layer it is. So pretty wild to think that in our own solar system that's going on. Uh, Lori is asking, do planets have seasons? Do planets have seasons? That's a great question. I think it's going to depend on, I think they're all on some sort of an axis. That's why we have our seasons, uh, is because of the tilt of the Earth. So when you're on one side of the sun, you're tilted more away or more toward the sunshine. And then when you're on the other side of the sun, it's going to be the other way around. So any planet that has an axis, or tilt on its axis rather, is going to likely have some sort of season. Now, of course, the closer you are to the sun, the more of a part that's gonna play, but uh, that's a great question. Let's see, I think that might be my last one. So we know that there are some pretty wild winds here, but what I wanna do is try and measure them. So this here is a way you can make an anemometer at home. Now, the first thing I did, because I, ideally, the best thing you do is find paper cups. All I could find were these little plastic cups. So they're a little tougher to work with. Oh, I have some paper ones. Oh, I man, should've I should've, should've asked. <laughs> so the first thing that I did, because this was the part that was a little bit tougher, I'll show you. I just took this pencil and eventually stuck it through the bottom, and I want the eraser to be closer to the top. So I'm trying to get it so it's a little bit looser so that this thing will spin. Unfortunately, the, uh, the friction is a little bit tough. It's kind of holding it back. But what we're gonna do is try and build an anemometer. So that's how we measure the wind speed. The first thing we're gonna do is take this, now that we have it in here, you're gonna need five cups, and then ideally a pencil, and again, something that's, uh, well, let me see, I'm gonna have to grab one more thing I left over there. Um, Brett, I should have a push pin over there. I think it's a yellow one. So then you'll need a push pin as well. You need to have an eraser to make it, make it work this way. Taking our first cup, what we're gonna do is put four holes in it just below the rim. Thank you very much. So we'll go here. And again, if you do have paper cups, that is probably the easiest. Now I want those holes to be basically equidistant from each other. And all I mean by that is you'll have two that are right across on one side, and then you'll have the other ones halfway in between those. Let me see, I don't wanna. And the only reason I say right below the rim is that way it just makes it a little bit easier to try and keep them even and keep them in the same place. All right, so now we have four holes going across. And the next thing we're gonna do with our other four cups, so this is gonna be the center of our anemometer. This is the part that ideally is gonna spin around. Then we're gonna take our other four, and this time we're gonna do holes that are adjacent to each other or close to and next to each other. So I've got that first one. I'm gonna go not quite a quarter of the way around, probably closer to 
maybe one sixth of the way around, something like that, go right about there. So to give you an idea, kind of close, but not too close. So you gotta have a little bit of distance in between them. We're gonna do that on all four of our next cups. So I've got two, and I'm hoping, if you do this with paper cups at home, I think it'll probably work a lot easier for you as far as getting this thing to spin, but here we go. All right, our last cup. All right, and now, you need some straws. Ideally, if, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of working with stuff today that is not, not, the, not the best example, but I have bendy straws. If you've got straws that aren't bendy, that are solid all the way through, that is going to work a little bit better. So what we're gonna do here first, I like to do it like this, put this in, and we're gonna ultimately go across on both sides. And now you might start to see how this is gonna come together. We've got this part down here. Now what we need is something that's actually going to catch the wind. So we've got these cups. So I'm going to try and put, feed through one side and then the other hole there. And the reason I like to put them in first is you can get an idea, you want everything to be even. You want your cups to all face the same way. So now I've got one on there and all I'm doing is feeding through one hole and then through the other one. You can get an idea too of now why it's important to kind of have your holes at the right distance. If they're too close together, the straw is not gonna go through there very well. And then we'll do this one here. And again, just making sure everything's either facing clockwise or counterclockwise, you just need them all the same. As I say that, I almost did it backwards. I don't know if you do wanna mention, speaking of clockwise and counterclockwise, I wasn't really gonna mention, but once yeah. you talked about um, hurricane or tropical cyclone Olivia, that the Coriolis effect is different for yeah, us that's, yeah, that's... than it is for... So down in Australia, their hurricanes are... They, they blow clockwise. Right. And our hurricanes twist counterclockwise. Yep. So, also because of that Coriolis effect. Yeah, so the Coriolis force we were talking about there in the northern hemisphere turns everything to the right... And in the southern hemisphere, it turns everything to the south. That's the same sort of reason that rationale is while you hear people say, like, the water flushes backwards in Australia and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And that's not true. But, I mean, I guess if the toilet's designed that way, it would be true. But <laughs> that's not because of the Earth's rotation. So now you can get an idea. See how this is coming together. And because these are plastic cups, I think it actually works to hold the cups in place a little bit better. If your cups are moving all over, just take a piece of tape and kind of tape right across there. Then the other thing you might have to tape, depending on your straws, would be kind of taping the X of the straws there together as well. But what we're going to do is just take our push pin and push it right through, ideally. Let me see here. Easier said than done. Let's see if I can hold it. Yeah, I might need... Oh, through the eraser? Yep, so you're going to go through both straws and then through the eraser. Now, you want it to be kind of loose. If it's too tight, then you're not going to get anything to spin. And ultimately, I wish I had a... I need a hair dryer or something. I've got my leaf blower, but that might be a, that might be a little much. Uh, but you get the idea here. So now we've got all of our cups. <laughs> Samantha, you, you want to try? Uh, so you get, you get the idea. <laughs> there we go. So now, so now it's getting loosened up a little bit. Thank you very much. Was Sam. it? I don't even know if I had it on there. <laughs> uh, but so that's the idea. So now we're able to catch the wind in here. And as long as your cups are all facing the same way, that's key. If you've got them facing different directions, it won't work. But you're able to get kind of everything twisting in here. Now, oh, we if could it, go up onto the ceiling. Yeah, if we could go up to the roof, you'd really get... You'd, and as soon as you go outside, it should work a lot better for you if you've got any breeze out there. The key, if yours is totally stuck, is a couple things. And that's my biggest problem is in the bottom there that this is probably just a little too tight. I, what I could probably do is put a little bit of soap on there or something to just kind of lubricate it some, and that would probably help it. And then up here, uh, if, you're, if your push pin is too tight, that will stop it from spinning as well. So let me see here, maybe I can even, if I just take that up, I'll go even looser. But you get the idea. So we want, you need it tight enough so that your straws don't spin on you, but you need it loose enough so that they'll still rotate around. Uh, but there you go, starting to get a little bit, a little bit freer. But that's kind of our homemade anemometer. Now, if you really wanted to get an idea of how to measure the wind with this, what I would do is take a red marker, color one of the cups, and if you can, have to get your parents to help you, of course, but what, the, what you can do is if you can get them to drive maybe down the road at just a few miles an hour, five to maybe 10 miles an hour, you have to have this nice and secure, but you could hold this out the window and you could count how many times it spins around. What I would do is set a timer for maybe 10 seconds 
and then going at 10 miles an hour, you're able to count how many times it spins around, and then that gives you an idea of how many revolutions would happen in 10 seconds, and you can turn that ultimately into miles per hour. Because every one of these, our homemade anemometers, is gonna spin a little bit differently, and it's gonna to react to different wind speeds. So it's hard for me to say that if it spins around 10 times, it's this speed. So you kinda of have to do a little bit of calibrating of your weather instrument. And you guys can get as fancy as you want with this. This is what I use. You can use dowel rods instead of straws to make it work a little bit better. Uh, if you take your thing, you might be able to stick it inside of something like this soda bottle. So then it's going to work even. Wow. Should have done that the first time. But that way you'll be able to get an even kind of looser uh, looser rotation. I think because of my, oops, because I don't have paper cups, this is probably a much better way for me to do it. That way I can put the put my pencil in all the way into the eraser and now we can balance it on there <laughs> you get the idea. it's off balance a little bit if you had something that had an even smaller opening that would work better uh, but you get the idea so now of course this one wouldn't, wouldn't hold up too well in the wind but uh, so that's something fun to try at home get an idea of how, just how windy it is where you are if it's not too windy, it's kind of tough. You might have to get out the hair dryer or put it in front of a fan to get it to start moving. Uh, but on windy days, something like this, even though it's really simple, wouldn't have any trouble kind of spinning around and catching the wind out there. So, uh, hope you guys learned something. This is wind, is, wind is pretty much one of our simplest weather things. When we talk about the forecast for us too as meteorologists, that's a really big player in what type of weather we're gonna see next, where the wind is coming from, how fastly, how, how quickly, excuse me, it's bringing the weather here, uh, all kind of plays a part. So again, the biggest things you need if you wanna do the same way we did is five cups, two straws, a pencil with an eraser, and a push pin, and you should be able to make your own anemometer at and home. And a hole puncher. Yep, and a hole puncher, that's true. So you can use, you can use different things, uh, the bigger cups, you could use wooden sticks, the dowel rods instead, uh, to make different kinds, but should be something pretty fun and pretty easy you could do at home and kebab sticks. Kebab sticks. Yep, that's actually that was my other my other option. So. <laughs> uh, but if anybody has any questions, please leave them in the comments. Sorry we got started a little bit later today, um, but hopefully, it's a great Earth Day project too. Yeah, it is. And yeah, speaking of Sam, if you want to tell them what you're doing later today. Um. Yeah. yeah I. Around. Uh, the uh, Dominion Energy posted a few at home. Um, things that you can do and we might even think of ideas that, that we would do on here but um, just showing you it, it's kind of like what we did today um, you can make a car that had so that the wind can push your car and um, just showing you different ways that the earth can supply the energy for us here on earth and it's earth it's the 50th anniversary of earth day um, 50 years ago today they decided that they needed to start respecting the earth and loving the earth and being thankful for all that she delivers for us so awesome that's what we're doing today um just some projects on how the the wind is like josh said very special to our earth because it doesn't blow us away <laughs> but it also can provide energy um there's a lot of areas Oops. out sorry go back in um like the central u.s that has wind turbines uh, where it's really windy out there and the wind moves these big turbines just like this and it creates energy so yep. that's kind of how that car is going to move and just like we did show you the wind can it moves the turbines and then it just creates energy and then people can even live off of that rather than having to burn fossil fuels so so well thank you so much for joining us guys uh really appreciate it hopefully this is something you can you can do at home with most likely things you already have you might have to get a little creative to use some uh some slightly different things than we did here with our little our little kind of bathroom plastic cups but uh hopefully that's something you can do and hopefully you you enjoyed our weather school today we'll be back with another one next week to be honest i'm not quite sure what i want to dive into so if you have any suggestions or anything you'd like us to try and cover just let me know Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.